Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to our session on supplier portals and best practice in supplier onboarding and enablement. My name is Anthony Payne. I'm in the marketing team at Hicks, uh, and I am delighted to be joined by uh, Kurt Albertson, who is principal and North American practice lead at the Hackett Group. Um, and when I hand over to uh, Kurt uh, in a few slides time, uh, he'll, he'll give himself a little bit more of an introduction. But great to have you here, Kurt. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Andy. Anthony, appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? All good. Perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, and so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, just by way of sort of logistics and housekeeping, uh, I'm sure this isn't your first webinar. Uh, but as with any of these, uh, there's plenty of opportunity to ask questions throughout. You can enter them into the chat um, and uh, we'll monitor those. And then when we get to the end of the prepared material, um, I'll kind of uh, chair a Q&A session based on those questions or any that come in as we're talking. Um, and we'll go from there. And then the, the other point is, as ever, uh, these sessions are recorded and, and you will be able to uh, uh, watch back the recording at your leisure in due course. So by way of agenda, um, we're going to kick off. Uh, I'm going to spend really a very short amount of time, five minutes max, talking a little bit about why we should be thinking about spar onboarding at all. Uh, it is, after all, not really a new topic, um, but we do think it's important and I'm going to touch a little bit on why. Uh, and then it's going to talk a little bit about uh, why now? Why is it that this topic is kind of rearing its head again? Uh, why is it we're hearing from lots of organizations that want to address the bar onboarding? Why is it the hacker group are uh, continuing to invest time uh, to research the topic and talk about it? So why now? Um, I'm then going to hand over to Kurt, <clears throat> who is going to provide uh, his and the hacker group's perspective on this. Uh, it's got some interesting new data points to support some of the points. Uh, talk about process and best practices. Uh, the key metrics relating to onboarding uh, and technology. And then I shall wrap with uh, literally, and I promise, one slide just uh, with our kind of observations, Hicks's observations on um, how you might consider evaluating onboarding solutions. And I'm at pains to point out this is not uh, a Hicks product presentation at all. We're talking about the topic of supplier onboarding. Um, but we'll just give a few thoughts on that before we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, so, for those of you that don't know us, uh, Hicks is a provider of supplier management solutions, and um, uh, that is about all I'll say about Hicks as a product vendor. Um, but one of our core offerings is supplier onboarding, and the companies you see, the logos you see on this slide, um, are organizations that uh, we either help directly with the some, uh, supplier onboarding or supplier onboarding is part of the offering um, that we provide to them. Um, and I say that because the opinions I'll share in a moment are inf sort of in, uh, uh, informed by conversations with organizations like this and many others over sort of many years of work uh, in this space. So why is it we should focus on, on supplier onboarding? It isn't a new topic, as I said already. Um, uh, and one of the reasons is some new data, which Kurt is going to talk about, which I'm not going to give away. <clears throat> But I think in the end, it's it's about efficiency, right? Automating the supplier onboarding process can can, can deliver very significant um, efficiencies. Um, and it is possible to take quite a narrow view of onboarding. Uh, you can think of it simply as from the point uh, a new supplier request is required um, to the point that the uh, uh, supplier is set up in the ERP. And if we move away from uh, sort of email and Excel based or dominated manual processes, and we start to automate and think in terms of workflow, there is plenty of saving and plenty of opportunity for efficiency uh, to be had. Um, you can think about reducing cycle times from you know, as much as three months down to as little as two or three days. Um, and we've talked to organizations that have been able to reduce the cost of onboarding in terms of FTEs from uh, you know, by up to sort of 80%. Um, but actually this quite narrow view uh, of onboarding um, is not the one we think you should be taking. We don't think this view is correct, and the organizations I flashed up the logos of on the previous slide also don't. And the way I think we should be thinking about Spire onboarding is as um, laying the foundations for what you might think of as world-class supplier management. And you're laying two types of data foundation. You're laying a, a supplier data foundation, and you're laying, uh, uh, you're laying down a supplier experience foundation. Uh, and that data foundation will serve the business um, for the life cycle of the relationship. It enables you to better manage risk. It enables you to better manage and ensure you're compliant. 
It enables you to manage and deliver on your ESG commitments. Um, it also, by laying that foundation early, means you can establish principles and, and processes of data governance. And of course, having better data means you can um, to support uh, decision making that better supports the business. And I've mentioned efficiency already, and of course, that efficiency starts with onboarding. But actually, having a data foundation built on great supplier onboarding um, enables you to uh, become more efficient right across the business from any supplier related process, whether that's in accounts payable, in the quality team, in those teams responsible for risk, when we're thinking about product and innovation. So laying that supplier onboarding foundation to, to enable better supply data is key. And then the other um, area of, uh, of where supplier onboarding, great supplier onboarding lays the foundation is in thinking about the end-to-end -end supplier relationship, or as we would call it at Hicks, um, delivering a great supplier experience. And these are the foundations that enable you to get you and your supplier to get most of that out of that relationship. And that covers areas like performance management. It also covers things like innovation and collaboration. How can you and your suppliers work jointly together to, to develop a product area or expand the market uh, or become more successful in multiple ways? Um, and ultimately, by thinking of supplier onboarding as creating a foundation for supplier experience, you're also heading towards or well on the way to getting that highly desirable status of customer of choice. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea that if you adopt a supplier onboarding process, which is thinks beyond just, I need to get the supplier into the ERP, but actually thinks about best practice and thinks about laying foundations of great data and great experience, um, hopefully that makes sense. So why now? Why is it now? This is, as I said right at the start, this isn't a new topic. Um, people have been trying to address supplier onboarding for a long time. So why are we seeing organizations can continue to try and address this problem uh, in this day and age. Well, firstly, and you can see the factors I'm, I'm going to talk through briefly on the left. Uh, firstly, we're thinking about that there's more and more requirements for data. Anybody who works in the procurement or supply chain function, and indeed many of the other functions that touch suppliers will know the demands uh, you as an organization have on your suppliers to collect more and more data, whether it's related to ESG type initiatives, to performance, to quality, to risk related initiatives, that that list that list of topics that that um, uh, those kind of requests um, it's only going in one direction. We're only in, um, uh, being required to collect more and more. So the way to think about supplier onboarding and how that feeds into great supplier data and why it matters from a data collection perspective is if you are just onboarding your supplier and just gathering the bare requirement bare minimum requirements in order to be able to trade with them or issue them a purchase order and you're not thinking about data hierarchy and you're not thinking about data structure, it means you're not able to store that additional data when it comes in, that additional information in an organized and structured and manageable way uh, and, and build for the long term. So the second area, uh, the second reason why supplier onboarding is so important now um, is organizations, perhaps like yours, are and have been over the last couple of years, investing very significant, uh, significant amounts of money in time in developing and growing their procurement tech stack. You'll have heard the term best of breed a lot, I'm sure. You'll have seen spider diagrams or, or diagrams with an awful lot of logos and different types of application um, and investment in procure tech over the last few years. Every time you add a piece of technology to your business, you're almost certainly adding a new database, a new store for some part of data related to your supplier. And so by not uh, um, sorry, the second thing you're doing is quite possibly, depending on that application, is you're also expecting your supplier to interact with that piece of software. So if we think about supplier onboarding as the facilitator to those applications, having a single store of data that supplies or, or is in sync with those different best of breed applications, um, and ideally a single sign on and a single place for your suppliers to go to connect to those applications, you can see that everything starts with supplier onboarding. I've talked a little bit about customer of choice already and why uh, and hinted at it being so important. But I think one quick easy way to summarize that is based on some research that Hicks did uh, a little over a year ago now where we spoke to or we surveyed um, over 500 suppliers to the very largest organizations in the world. Um, and one of the topics we explored was what, what does it mean for your customer, for you to serve a customer that you consider to be customer of choice? And the, the, the headline stat that came back from that was that 73% of suppliers said they would go the extra mile for a company that they considered to be customer of choice versus 49% uh, for a customer that they considered just to be important. 
So that kind of difference in what the attitude that the supplier has towards you as a customer uh, and how much work or how hard they're prepared to work or what they're prepared to offer as a supplier goes up if you're customer of choice. And again, by thinking about supplier onboarding, thinking about the supplier experience, thinking about the data you're collecting, you're setting yourself up uh, far better to be customer of choice for the maximum number of suppliers. I've hinted it or touched on risk a couple of times already, but again, um, risk isn't going away. There's no sort of idea that, that levels of risk are, are reducing for organizations. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. And the number of areas or vectors of risk uh, continues to grow at a very rapid rate. But we can think about just two maybe as an example. One would be say cybersecurity and the other business continuity. I think it's the case now that most companies recognize that along with their employees, suppliers represent actually the biggest potential gap in their cyber defenses. And so again, when you're thinking about onboarding your suppliers, um, how you're managing their data, you need to think very carefully and consider how different types of supplier have different levels of access uh, required into your systems. And again, that comes back to onboarding. Uh, and similarly, business continuity uh, for your organization. We've seen all sorts of events and every webinar you go to refers to the pandemic and the war and Suez Canal. But these are events that disrupt supply chains. And if you get onboarding right, you're gathering the right kind of information which enables you to communicate very, very quickly with suppliers, be able to identify which suppliers might be, might be impacted by a given event. Uh, you know, which of your suppliers are in agriculture in, in Ukraine or in that region, which means the war is most likely to be disruptive versus those that are less likely to be disrupted. So if you're gathering the right data during the onboarding process, it enables you to manage business continuity risk uh, in a much more informed and efficient way. And then finally, it's not just, we don't want to just think about suppliers as risk and sort of keep them at, at arm's length. Um, our suppliers can be the biggest source of, of innovation biggest potential source of innovation. And again, there's a really good quote from the former CPO of Schneider Electric, which I shall finish on before handing over to Kurt, when he said that 75% of our innovations are now coming from startups and 25% are coming from our strategic suppliers. But five years ago, this ratio was the exact opposite. So in other words, a company as large as Schneider Electric is looking at its large, very large supply base and at the, the mass, not just the handful at the top, and viewing those as a huge source of, of uh, potential innovation. Again, if you onboard correctly, if you collect the right data, if you deliver a great supplier experience, then your ability to tap into that uh, innovation uh, improves significantly. So uh, I will now uh, hand over to Kurt. Just wanted to open with some thoughts about why this topic is important and why now. Uh, and after <laughs> Kurt's presentation, uh, I'll come back with a few thoughts on how you might uh, think about selecting a vendor. Um, and as a reminder, please do submit questions throughout and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. So with that, I'm delighted to welcome Kurt again and she'll hand over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Anthony. I appreciate it. Um, let me, oh, perfect. I have the ability to control now. So uh, as Anthony said, and Anthony, I love your comment about, um, you know, the, the, the concept of being a, a customer of choice. You know, it's it's interesting. It's one of the common themes we see. I spent a lot of time with, with companies and, and, and procurement and across that source to settle space. And, um, you know, we don't always make it very, we don't make it easy to do business with us, with our suppliers. I'll just leave it at that. So that idea of a customer of choice is, is critical, particularly um, when you have a lot of volatility in the mar in just in the environment, which we certainly have had over the last several years. So, uh, look forward to jumping into this topic. It's an important one. It's probably, if we look at it from a process perspective at Hackett, uh, supplier onboarding, supplier information management, this topic is one of the hottest topics out there right now in terms of just the conversations we're having. Let me, uh, let me dive into this because um, those of you who know the Hackett group, we certainly have quite a bit of information, right? Um, and I'll, I'll kind of just give you a, a quick overview of Hackett for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Foundationally, we are a empirically based benchmarking firm. We collect a lot of data. Uh, I manage our North American Procurement Advisory Program along with uh, some of the other senior advisors at the Hackett Group. We work across hundreds of companies, helping them transform um, their source to settle functions as well as the broader GNA functions back office. But 
at the heart of Hackett is our data, and we use that data to help drive empirical discussions with our clients. So those of you, um, you probably have been on a Hackett presentation before, you're going to get a lot of information kind of thrown at you. So uh, the good news is I'm not going to boil the ocean on every slide, but the presentation will be there um, to follow up on so you can get the information. Um, I've got about 30 years experience in this source to settle space uh, across various areas. So um, let me start out with our signature study we do every year, our 2024 key issue study, looking at kind of an executive perspective, right, of what's on the mind, right? Think about what's been going on, you know, still in an inflationary environment, particularly depending on where you are around the globe. Um, you know, certainly concerns about recession and, you know, are we going to kind of tip the scale and kind of move into a recessionary environment? Still having supply continuity issues uh, left over from the, you know, post pandemic, but also based on some of the geopolitical issues and also some of the some of the logistics things that we're running into around the globe. Um, Gen AI is now coming into play here, and, and we put out some research that that's going to revolutionize kind of GNA backed functions uh, as well as others. There's you know the high interest rate environment still. There's a lot going on right now, and typically, what we see in these situations is when we think about what are companies doing to kind of you know mitigate some of the risks they associate with the overall environment. The top two are things around process efficiency and increased process automation, which really sets up this discussion very nicely, right? Um, this idea of supplier onboarding, supplier onboarding solutions in this critical process that yes, efficiency is important, but a lot of the things Anthony talked about, particularly with increased risk viewed out there, and that's only gonna continue um, the supplier onboarding process really is a foundational process to really collecting and maintaining information that's going to be needed to help us address a lot of the issues that we need to focus on. And I'll get more to that. Um, if we think about kind of, you know, zeroing in now in that kind of purchase to pay, so that rec to pay process, which is kind of where we look at the supplier onboarding process as part of Hackett's taxonomy. Um, you know, it's the, the, the same old theme we've seen for a while, right? Doing more with less. This comes from our key issue studies. Uh, we're being asked to take on more to support the, you know, the ever increasing complexities of the environments. We're, we're still looking to reduce resource counts and budgets. How are we doing that? Well, digital transformation, right? You see a, about a four and a half percent increase in P2P technology spend to offset that productivity gap that we're finding. So this theme of doing more with less continues, right? Um, and if we kind of drill down a little bit more and say, okay, well, how are we managing to kind of address, you know, kind of this environment we're in, the priorities of kind of that source to settle space? Um, you, and you look at kind of the top 10 <clears throat> areas of focus for purchase to pay leaders, um, you know, it's, it's dominated by digital transformation efforts, right? Smart automation, analytics and intelligence, data analytics and reporting, guided buying, supplier and voice processing. And the number three uh, initiative, improvement initiative, this supplier onboarding process. And this is getting so much more attention. I mean, I think supplier and voice processing has probably been on there since I started at Hackett 20 years ago. So that's no surprise. But this idea of supplier onboarding which honestly, you know, go back, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, um, it wasn't a conversation we were having as much with clients in terms of kind of the complexities that we're now running into. Now it is a top three improvement initiative, um, you know, across the market. And why is that? A lot of the a lot of the reasons, you know, Anthony talked about, but. Uh, I think if you look at this slide, it becomes pretty obvious. This is this is kind of asking those, you know, kind of source to settle leaders about their purchase to pay process and what are their priorities, right? Well, if you look at that supplier onboarding process, a lot of the things Anthony talked about are represented on this list. Certainly at the top six are P2P digital transformation, absolutely supplier onboarding, some of the new technologies, more advanced technologies, best in class technologies. Um, being implemented to kind of, you know, replace this email, Word, Excel-based environment we all 
kind of love to still live in in many cases. Stakeholder satisfaction. Well, this is a process, the supplier onboarding process that has long been an area of frustration for our internal stakeholders. Why does it take so long you know, to, to be able to use a supplier? Uh, and then from the supplier's perspective, right? Anthony mentioned this idea of customer choice. You know, this is a cumbersome, frustrating process a lot of times for your external stakeholders, suppliers. Um, more value from P2P process. Uh, you know, it's not just about efficiency, right? You know, a lot of the things around risk, greater visibility to information so we can drive some of our priorities. I'll talk more about that. Uh, data capture and data quality, right? I already talked about that this supplier onboarding process is becoming that critical, critical process to collect quality information and maintain that information, which ultimately is gonna feed a lot of the activities over the life cycle of engaging with our suppliers. So we need to kind of have good data, collect that data and manage it. Analytics and insight process quality, I've already kind of talked about those things. So when you kind of step back and say, well, hey, purchase to pay process leader, what are your top priorities? The supplier onboarding process really does focus on enabling a lot of those. And if you kind of back up a little bit, there's a, and look at the broader kind of procurement leadership or even kind of finance leadership, depending on your perspective, this idea of data analytics and reporting becoming a much more critical initiative for the functions like procurement and finance to execute on their objectives is becoming front and center, right? It is the, if we looked at the procurement key issue study we just did and asked procurement leadership, what are the top improvement initiatives uh, that you're focused on? Data analytics and reporting is number one, whether it's reporting on ESG objectives and status, whether it's monitoring supply risk, whether it's looking for preferred suppliers and trying to take out cost, a lot of reasons why we're really leaning into it. We're becoming a much more data intensive not only culture, but that's reflective in the functions like procurement and finance with respect to we need good data across a broad set of topics these days to be an effective organization to our stakeholders. And that's, uh, and again, the supplier only is important for P2P process leaders, but even at the higher level of procurement functional leaders and finance functional leaders, it really is enriching Perspectives they have with good quality data so we can better manage risk, you know, ESG reporting and strategies, all of those great things that we're trying to do. So um, let's let's kind of drill down now into the, the specific supplier onboarding process, right? Um, you know, certainly if we even looked at this just from an efficiency thing, right? This is a, it, it's a big focus, right? Uh, our data, this comes from a recent study we did on, on the supplier onboarding process. Uh, by the way, we probably have done three or four of these studies over the last several years just because of the criticality of it. Um, the median organization, just to give you a number, and again, we're looking at kind of a profile here, um, the median organization onboards new suppliers, about 10% of their overall supply base. So it's not insignificant of an activity. Now, to give you some perspective on that, if you look at kind of a median company with $5 billion of annual spend, which is kind of where you know, the companies we're working with are in that general range, the number of suppliers being onboarded annually is about you know, 2,600 suppliers. That's a lot of suppliers to have to be onboarding not, and then let's not even think of, forget about the aspect of, you know, there's a lot of suppliers that that information needs to be updated. So, you know, for a, a, a typical company, five billions in spend, 2,600 suppliers being uh, onboarded each and every year, plus the ongoing maintenance of that, that information for that upper quartile. So top 25% of companies, um, it's almost twice that. So it's, it's, it's like 5,000 suppliers. So it's a lot of activity we're having to manage here. Um, and that has a lot of impact. So just from a definitional perspective, let's take another step back and just say, when we talk about supplier onboarding, what does that process include, right? Well, it's about, you know, the, the requesting and, and approving of suppliers to add, right? We, you know, we just don't add all suppliers or some companies do, I guess, but hopefully we've got some type of approval process in place to validate supplier ads. 
Um, then we've got to collect a lot of information, right? That collection process is a cumbersome process. So there's a lot of different internal stakeholders and suppliers that have to be involved getting that information. We need to do a better job of collecting that information. The validation of that information, uh, whether it's tax IDs, but more importantly, supply risk assessments and making sure the supplier you know, is, is aligned with our risk profile and the risk criteria we have, whether it's you know, whether it's cybersecurity risk or related to, you know, ESG risk. Um, then we've got to set them up in the supplier. And then the, the all important managing of supplier information on an ongoing basis. So that's kind of this broad scope of, of the life cycle of supplier onboarding. Very critical process. Um, and it's important to kind of look at it in its entirety, um, because I think one of the critical things we see is a lot of times companies don't really think about the broad scope. And they've got one group who's responsible for supplier ads. They've got another group that's responsible for validation. You know, the ongoing managing is, is, is handled by different folks. And they really don't look at this collectively as an ongoing end-to-end -end process here. Very critical. Um, you know, at Hackett, we're, you know, we've got a lot of maturity models. One of the ones we have is for kind of this, this process of, you know, onboarding, managing supplier information. I won't boil the ocean on this, but I will talk about some of the critical enablers that leading companies have. First of all, they standardize the process with roles and responsibilities, right? We got to clarify that. We have to have kind of a single owner of this process, um, even though it touches a lot of different groups. We need solutions, right, to manage both new suppliers and existing master records. We can't work in this environment of email, Excel, Word documents anymore. Um, we need to have suppliers be able to manage their own information. This is a very cumbersome process. If we take on 100% responsibility for managing all this information, it needs to be a shared responsibility with our suppliers. We need to give them the tools to support this and the processes to support this. Um, and then we need, as I talked about before, we need to enrich the information with good quality information that very much provides us information that can be used to drive the priorities we have. Again, whether it's around things like supply risks, supplier diversity, sustainability, so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of where we see leading organizations, if I was going to summarize it into kind of a couple of talking points. Um, but let's drive into this a little more deeper here as well. Um, so if we think about kind of the broad source to pay ecosystem of technology, um, you know, we kind of break the world into kind of the end-to-end -end core procurement technologies, which you see there, the upstream procurement tools, the downstream procurement tools. Then there's another layer of supporting and emerging procurement technologies. And then there's some of these digital automation, certainly a lot of conversations about Gen AI today. That would be with one of these digital automation supporting tools. Um, you see that, you know, supplier onboarding is a core part, and we view it as a core part of that end-to-end -end core procurement technologies. And that's changed. I would say when we, this, this, you know, source to pay technology ecosystem diagram that I'm showing you here, you know, go back six, seven years ago and supplier onboarding we viewed as more of a supporting and emerging procurement technologies. Uh, and a lot of the capabilities were kind of, you know, embedded in maybe your ERP, maybe your suite solution, or maybe in, you know, paper, email types environments. Now it is a it is a pillar of that end-to-end -end core procurement technology piece. Um, that said, when we kind of look at the market out there in terms of what companies are doing, um, it's still shocking to me. And obviously this doesn't add up to 100% because companies are using different tools. But if you, you ask companies, what are they using to kind of manage this process of supplier onboarding that we just talked about? It is a still a kind of patchwork of different tools out there. And to some extent, it may kind of always be, but to the degree that we're seeing right now, there is certainly a huge opportunity right now to better uh, improve kind of the capabilities we have to support this process from a technology perspective. Almost 50% are primarily relying still on, e more, on email, Word, Excel files, um, you know, and that's just not going to cut it. The good news is we do see 
you know, uh, just slightly less percentage of organizations implementing supplier self-service portals. Um, but there's still, you know, kind of this foundational reliance on the ERP solutions that are out there. You see a lot of companies relying on that. Uh, you're seeing a lot of companies kind of manage, you know, okay, some of the functionalities in our supply risk environment, we are using kind of SIM solutions, but uh, maybe sourcing procurement solutions, some of these suite solutions. In the end, you know, it's bits and pieces of these different functionalities, including paper, email, that ultimately we're trying to use to kind of cobble together the, the capabilities we need to support this. We really do need to look at this process as a core component of our end-to-end -end, uh, technology ecosystem from a source to settle perspective. Um, and the good news is, you know, tools like Hicks uh, out there in the market have, have kind of migrated and become much, much more mature over the years uh, and really do kind of fit well within this environment. Um, and the benefits are significant, right? You know, we talked about this idea of efficiency, right? Reported benefits for supplier onboarding technology, the consolidation of the onboarding steps and checklists, right? Making this, this is a very complex process. Um, you know, you think this is done, you know, at every company, uh, you know, every company yet still, when we talk to companies, Everyone does it slightly different, right? Everyone wants different information. Everyone wants slightly different resources doing different roles. It's a complex process. We need to be able to consolidate that process. And that is one of the benefits of these types of technologies. Improved data availability, right? And data quality, the next two. I've already kind of talked about that, right? Procurement finance, the functions are really relying on this underlying data that's collected during this process and managed during this process to execute on a lot of their priorities, including the next one we see around risk identification. You know, Anthony talked about supply risk. It obviously, it obviously, you know, kind of got a spotlight shown on it over the last kind of four or five years. Um, it's not going away, right? When we look at our key issue study and we look at procurement's priorities, supply risk wasn't even in the top 10, you know, go back, you know, pre-pandemic. Now it is a you know, top three priority and it's going to stay in that top three to five range in terms of procurement's priorities, just because of some of the complexities in our environment and understanding what, what happened if we didn't focus on it effectively in the past. So that's gonna be important. We need the data collected during the supplier onboarding process to manage that. Um, cycle times, right? We can't take months to add suppliers. That's just not gonna, that's just not gonna cut it. Uh, and we have to have efficient processes. All of those are reported benefits of these supplier onboarding technologies. Um, Let's let's put some numbers to some of those benefits, right? I mean, it's easy just to kind of talk about them uh, as I just did, but you know, again, at Hackett, we really like to quantify some of the benefits associated with this. Let's start with this kind of, you know, kind of what everybody, the first one people kind of gravitate towards, but certainly I would argue not even the most critical things like risk, being able to kind of understand ESG status, all of that stuff is becoming much much more critical you know, the user-friendly environment to become this customer of choice, to have internal satisfaction and be able to onboard suppliers in a timely manner. All of those, I would say, probably even out trump the efficiency side, but because people tend to focus on it, let's zero in on it, right? So in our recent study, what we focused on was, okay, how, if, if you look at this, the source to settle resources, the folks that are really involved in managing this process, and this isn't even capturing I should caveat this, this isn't even capturing like the supplier's time and effort or your kind of requester internal stakeholders efforts. This is really just the time and cost of your, um, you know, source to settle resources that are involved in managing this process. And we kind of broke the group into, OK, you've got low risk suppliers and you've got high risk suppliers. Right. Uh, and this is for when you have to go through, including any kind of risk assessment, you know, kind of you see the processes included, similar to what I showed you previously. But we attempted to put kind of an FTE, full-time equivalent hours associated with kind of onboarding these, these uh, you know, a supplier. And we put quartiles around it, right? So you're just looking at the statistical distribution here. 
Um, so for example, the, the, the you know, bottom quartile is, is 32.3 FTE hours to, of time and effort to onboard a high risk supplier. That's a lot of time considering someone else, the top quartile is doing it uh, in, a, in 20%, you know, fifth, a fifth of that time. So different practices, you know, companies, there's some that are good at this, there's some that aren't very good at this and you kind of see that in the distribution. But then we kind of looked at some standard labor rates associated with the folks based on our benchmarking of the type of people that do these, that manage this process and came up with some dollar amounts and you see those, right? About $579 for a median labor cost, that would be the one with 12.5 FTE hours for onboarding on the right-hand side and lower risk suppliers, median labor cost is about $356. But you see for, again, the, the bottom quartile, it's two and a half times that. So, um, so you know, that there is a big variation here. And again, it comes down to best practices. It comes down to the level of technology that you've implemented, have you streamlined the processes, so on and so forth. Um, but just to kind of give some perspective on that, if we take this kind of, again, this median company with about $5 billion of annual spend, the supplier onboarding cost is, is over a million dollars a year, right? Just, to, just in labor cost of the folks who are involved in supporting this across the source to settle. That's not insignificant. Uh, and again, we're talking about a median company. If you're looking at that from the bottom quartile company, it's two and a half X that. So you're talking about two and a half million dollars of annual process or labor costs just to support this process versus, you know, kind of you see those top quartile companies, which are about half of that, right? So big numbers here, even if you're just kind of focusing in on the efficiency side here. Um, let, let's talk about the technology itself, right? Let's, let's really talk about supplier onboarding technology. <clears throat> Very important to focus on. Um, you know, at Hackett, uh, every year we go out and what we call our key issue study and kind of take a look at all, you know, kind of going back to that ecosystem slide that I showed you, what's the current level of adoption, what's the expected growth rates, and, and also importantly, how satisfied are the folks or, or individuals, how, how satisfied as we as users are in terms of the technology really helping us achieve our business objectives. And I think that's important to zero in on. Um, here, I'm just looking at that kind of top layer, the, the core source to settle technology and, uh, and the one I'm going to obviously focus on. And, well, in general, I'll say we generally see pretty good adoption of technology um, across kind of the core component. It's, it's most organizations have implemented something, uh, although there's still opportunity for growth and wider scale adoption beyond kind of a pilot, which might be a certain business unit or geography, as an example. Um, but what's interesting to me, particularly when we look at this kind of what should have jumped out of you already, and I did highlight it, if you think about the supplier onboarding process, mixed results when it comes to business objective realization to you know a higher degree than any of these other functionalities. Um, and that that wasn't just in 2024. We saw that we saw that last year as well. Um, you know, 43% said, you know, our supplier onboarding portals fell short of expectations. Now, consider the fact that a lot of companies responding to this, again, are in this environment of emails, Excel files, Word documents, bits and pieces, using our ERPs, using kind of bits and pieces of solution to kind of manage this. Okay, that's not surprising to me. Um, but it is worth noting, right? And, and you get a little bit of insight into what I just said if you kind of dive down a little deeper and ask the question, well, what are you actually using to support that process, right? Are you using kind of, are you primarily relying on your ERP functionality for the supplier onboarding process? You know, maybe you've implemented one of these end-to-end -end suite solutions out there, which do a very nice job in a lot of areas, but they can't be kind of best in class functionality across that whole core. That's just not possible. Uh, or have you started to implement some of these point solutions or best in class solutions like a Hicks, for example? Um, where are you on that scale? And you see 71% of, of companies are either kind of really leveraging ERP suite and some combination thereof, and then the offline tools 
Um, but a 35%, which is pretty high level of adoption, have kind of migrated some of these best in class point solutions. Uh, and particularly if you look at kind of the downstream procurement tools, that is one of the areas where they tend to kind of are continuing to move it we, to two best in class point solutions, just because of the complexity of the process, as well as the fact that if they don't, they tend to be on the left-hand side or in that red area of business objective realization. So when you do look at the underlying data, those that have tended to move towards point solutions or what some call best in class solutions, um, they do tend to generally report higher level of business objective realization uh, satisfaction on that. So uh, it is an underlying trend, right? Um, you know, and some of the things we've talked about, right, is, is why this is you know, so much more on the radar of, you know, like the CPO, for example, chief procurement officer, procurement's involvement in supplier onboarding process has increased significantly, um, you know, along with the use of kind of these central supply data management teams, right? There, there has been a big focus on the Oregon governance focus of supplier onboarding. I mentioned this idea of looking at it as an end-to-end -end process across the life cycle. That is an important foundational aspect. We can't, uh, someone's got to be responsible for it. And more and more often, it is falling to a procurement leader. Doesn't have to be. It could be someone in GBS, could be someone in finance, but someone needs to own this process. Um, we already talked about the complexity and manual nature of this still in a lot of organizations. Um, and again, this is an area because, you know, because of the void that's kind of there, because of, the, you know, the 43% of companies saying that, you know, the supplier onboarding portals fell short of their business objective realization. This is an area where best in class supplier onboarding technologies really have kind of built out their functionality to really kind of listen to the needs of stakeholders uh, in procurement and finance and build capabilities that can better support them. Um, and also, obviously, we already talked about the need to kind of engage suppliers and let them kind of self-manage more of their information so that we have a fighting chance of keeping the data quality up to date, up to date uh, over the life cycle of that supplier. So um, interesting if you kind of, you know, this is the one, you know, particularly on this slide that really jumps out at you on a, from a business objective realization perspective. And then diving down it is because of the characteristics of ERP suite solutions versus kind of these best in class uh, solutions that just have better functionality to manage this very complex process. All right, so uh, continuing on here, and we did want to leave a little bit of time left for uh, kind of Q&A, so I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Um, you know, how do you measure success of supplier onboarding? Well, there's a lot of different ways, right? But you know, the obvious one tends to be cycle time, tends to be the quality of the data next in line, uh, but also this idea of stakeholder satisfaction. And here we say internal customer satisfaction, but we also need to think about the satisfaction of our suppliers, right? Um, again, we, as, I, as the statement I made earlier, we don't often kind of um, think about how difficult we are as a company for suppliers to work with. Um, and that has impacts, right? Whether we're viewed as, whether we need them to view us at some point as this customer of choice, um, or whether we just need them to kind of give us good data, good quality data during that onboarding process and maintain it. Um, cycle time, so we'll drill down on that one again, and I'm not gonna get into the details here. You can kind of, you know, kind of look through this on your own, but we kind of broke the world into, you know, previously had a risk assessment or didn't have a risk assessment and, you know, how complex or high, high risk was the supplier. And you can see the numbers tend to be kind of all over the place, particularly if they haven't had a risk assessment in the past. Um, you know, you see kind of a more uh, distri you know, distributed nature, whereas on the left hand side, you see kind of top quartile and median pretty close together. Um, so what you see huge differences, right? You know, the extreme is high risk suppliers haven't had a risk assessment, it takes almost 50 days to onboard a supplier. And then the other extreme is, you know, for, for, for bottom quartile companies, the other extreme is for top quartile companies, for lower risk suppliers that have had a risk assessment, uh, it goes down to 12 days.
companies, right? So big variations, companies. So a lot of opportunity. What does that mean? Well, it means there's a lot of opportunity for companies to improve this process, whether it's through technology, process design, life cycle ownership of this process, all the best practices we talk to our clients about. Um, I'll leave you with this. I'm, I didn't intend to kind of go through this. This is really a summary slide, but what are some of those implementation considerations to think about? Everything from clearly defining onboarding objectives to the rolling out of you know, self-service solutions you know, so that suppliers can manage their information and everything in between. Um, you can kind of read through this as a checklist, as a follow-up. Um, but at this point, um, I'm going to turn it back over, Anthony, to you for, uh, for the Q&A portion of this. Perfect. Thank you ever so much, Kurt. That's uh, it was amazing. Um, some really, really interesting data points in the perspective, really valuable. I don't think the audience will be surprised to hear that that's very consistent with uh, with a lot of what Hicks thinks. So thank you. Okie doke. So uh, I have one slide. Uh, so you've got that long about three minutes to submit some questions and then we'll uh we'll definitely be finished before the hour uh, but we've already had four or five questions so looking forward to that but by way of final closing comments uh, and this overlaps a tiny bit with what kurt was saying or aligns let's say um but our view on on how you might think about uh or some considerations when you're looking to solve a supplier onboarding challenge um can be summarized on this slide so first first kind of observation is do it all in one system. I, I think it's really common for organizations to separate, for example, direct and indirect. They might use the procure to pay suite uh, to onboard indirect suppliers, uh, maybe very net, network centric. Um, and then they might use you know, supply chain applications or, or be very ERP centric for, for onboarding direct. Um, our view is a single system that can have, handle all supplier types uh, is the best approach. Um, not least because quite often you will have suppliers that kind of aren't obviously the direct or indirect or you know the, they're, they're more likely to be both um but also the processes are very similar it's redundancy and confusion uh, potentially it makes um spend analytics much more difficult um it makes the overall management of supplier data more difficult um and we also think it's not just thinking about your sort of classic suppliers but also think about government agencies that you pay tax to your employees on uh, employee referral programs into, com into company transfers. So think about those as supplier entities. They're in your ERP almost certainly if you're paying them. So think about them from a supplier onboarding perspective as well. And exceptions drive cost. It's very easy to sort of take the Pareto approach and say, well, if we get 80% of our supplier volume of that 2,600 average that um, Kurt referred to earlier, if we get 80% of them through, then we're more efficient. Well, clearly you are. Clearly, there's no doubt you will be more efficient if 80% of the suppliers go from a manual process to an automated one. But another way to think about that remaining 20 is percent is they're disproportionately expensive to manage. Exceptions drive cost. You have processes that take a lot longer for a small number of suppliers, maybe not even your most strategic and important suppliers. So that cost benefit uh, is not great. You, you need to automate as much as possible for all of your suppliers. And as well as driving cost, exceptions also increase risk, right? It's only, you don't need one supplier with that big hole in their cybersecurity policy to drive a big hole in your uh, firewall. Um, and they may not be in the 80%, but, but that risk is still very, very real. So, so thinking about 100% of suppliers um, is, we would say is absolutely key. Secondly, is that while I, I think all suppliers need to be included in the program, clearly they're not all equal. And that, that doesn't mean in terms of human rights, it means in terms of their importance to you as an organization, right? So understand the different questions that each type of supplier uh, needs to be asked, understand the different type of data you need to collect um, and adjust those questions so that every supplier gets to ask all of the questions they need, but only the questions they need. And, and one of the ways I think about it is, you might have a supplier onboarding survey or questionnaire that has 172 questions because you, you're a complex business and, and, and those questions apply in some cases. Nobody needs to fill in 172. If you've got a fairly, let's say, standard or non-complex or fairly straightforward supplier, let's say, who needs to fill in 27 of those, they still have to read the others. My maths isn't quick enough to tell you the gap. They have, still have to read all 172 to make sure that it doesn't apply to them. So you're not really saving them any work by saying just fill in these. So only show them those, right? So dynamically adjust based on what they need to complete. Third is, um, this is a bit of a mantra, Hicks, on board for the enterprise, not for a system. Like almost every department in your organization touches suppliers in some way or another. Um, so think about adding a supplier as a partner to your organization, not just a unit of work in your P2P system. 
And that means thinking about all of the data requirements um, that you might have today and in the future. And obviously you can't predict everything you're going to need in the future, but don't, but try to build in as much as you can up front. It will make life much easier downstream. But, but, but most importantly, think about onboarding for your company, not for a particular piece of software. Um, flexibility of the data model and workflow. So in order to achieve that 100% and, and those that sort of zero exceptions approach, your, your onboarding system has to be able to cover the complexity appropriate to your business. If you're the type of company onboarding seven suppliers a year and it's a fairly straightforward business, no problem. It's going to be easy to manage. But if you're onboarding 2,600 suppliers per Kurtz example a year across lots of different supplier types, lots of different territories and categories, um, then you need the flexibility both in the data model that the supplier data gets inserted into and also the workflow. Who needs to approve what? Is it based on spend threshold? Is it based on risk characteristic? Is it based on location? Is it based on category? You will find, but to go down a no exceptions route, your processes will have lots of exceptions that need to be managed. So, so think about the flexibility of the system that you're investing in. And finally, real quick, um, you know, a, a more traditional RF, RF driven process is still very common. Lots of organizations are investing or, 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 or selecting software in, in that way. And that's great. Um, where we see companies get the, the, the most satisfaction post sale if they've actually held vendors to account before the contract. And that the best way to do that is run a proof of concept, right? You know your use cases, um, pick out some that will apply to the 80% and then select one or two edge use cases that are maybe a little bit more, a little bit more tricky. Put your vendor to the test and see if they would be able to manage the workflows and the exceptions that, that are needed in order to support onboarding in that scenario. So those would be very, very quickly our, our quick sort of thoughts. Um, with that, we're uh, with eight minutes to go. We're at the end of the prepared content and we're going to shift over to Q&A. And we have had a couple. So um, I'll put these to, to Kurt primarily, um, but also there are a couple of ones where uh, uh, I'd like to pipe in too. Uh, so we'll do it that way. So first up, Kurt, um, and it's a great one to start with actually, is how do we keep the supplier data current without constantly pestering the supplier? Yeah, so no easy answer to that question, obviously, but, um, you know, a couple of things, right? Obviously, um, you know, it starts with, uh, well, the most obvious answer, right, is, is supplier self-service solutions, right? You know, how do we, we give them access to supplier self-service solutions so that they can maintain certain certain you know, pieces of data that we need them to maintain when, it, uh, when it's changed and using workflow to kind of kick off reminders of, you know, hey, has your information changed? So that, that's kind of a foundational component of that. But, but even beyond that, I think there's, there's just a foundational question we have to ask when we think about supplier onboarding, which is kind of what I related, you know, early in my conversation was, you know, suppliers are being asked to do this across all their customers, right? And I think one of the things we have to think about is as we design the process and all, as we think about the information we need, are there opportunities to kind of gravitate towards more standard opportunities of doing that, more best practice ways of doing that, right? Not just asking for the sake of asking, but is the information really needed? Um, to achieve our objectives? And are there standard ways of kind of collecting and asking for that information? So for example, in some industries, there are efforts to try to standardize on the types of information that might be needed for risk assessments, as an example. You know, varying levels of success with respect to that and participation from the, the industry participants in that, in that, in that, um, in that market segment um, but there is at least some efforts associated with that. Um, and then also this concept of kind of instead of a one-to-one -one reference with respect to a supplier managing their data, this idea of a one-to-many kind of, right? So, you know, a supplier is managing that in one source, um, and then it's updated to kind of all their customers as opposed to just that one customer. So just, just some high-level thoughts on there. And I'm sure, Anthony, you, you probably have some perspectives on that question as well. I, I certainly do. Yeah, I, I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into it in depth. I think I would just sort of highlight a, a couple of quick points. One is um, there is an inevitability here. You're, you're the customer. You need data from the suppliers. So that isn't going away. But one thing, um, one of the most common uh, problems that causes this, this 
pain that the suppliers feel is you're asking them stuff that you've already got. Um, and so from their perspective, you, you know, you're, it's redundant requests. So I alluded to this in the onboarding in terms of only ask them what you need to know, but it's only ask them once what you need to know. And that then comes back to a, how do you store that data? How do you um, uh, equip all of the teams in your business to be able to access it? Because it might be that, that you know, business unit A has been trading with that supplier for 10 years, has gathered all this information, business unit B wants to start trading with them. And they go and ask them all the same questions again. It's like, and the supplier's going, well, just, just ask your mates over there. <laughs> I've told you all this. So I think you can, yes, it's a big challenge, but you can do your suppliers a lot, a big favor by just, um, having your left hand and right hand talking to one another and in practice what that means is a single place for all supplier data um the other area of response here which we definitely don't have time to but i'd love to talk to anyone who'd like to talk about it is what we call a one-to-one -one supplier experience and that's using some techniques that marketers do and i'm a marketer which is how do you segment your suppliers in an intelligent way so that you can make them feel like everything is tailored just to them like we do as consumers it is very possible uh, the technology is all out there. It just requires a bit of a mindset shift. So that's a little bit of a uh, a teaser there. All right, we we're running low on time. Let's get to the next question. Um, this one was: you, you talked about cycle times being reduced. Um, have you seen any organisations or companies translate that reduction in cycle time into some kind of monetary value, or if not that, then at least some more specific value? And my interpretation on what that would be: well, cycle times quicker is obviously a good thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's about a business case. So people, you know, if we can reduce by X, this means that. Is that something you've come across? Well, I mean, it somewhat ties to the the data I shared on FTE cost and <clears throat> cost per, um, you know, cost per supplier onboarding, right? There, there is a correlation between the profiles, right? The companies that have longer cycle times on the, you know, bottom quartile portion of the data I showed you also tend to highly correlate with those that have higher cost associated with that process. So there is a direct correlation with that. But, uh, you know, the other things I think we see, though, is, you know, this idea of collecting internal stakeholder satisfaction information, right? As I mentioned, this tends to be an area that is a lot of dissatisfaction kind of voiced by internal stakeholders. Why does it take so long? They don't really understand why we're having to do a lot of this stuff and go through this process and collect all this information. Why do you keep bugging me to provide this information? Uh, why can't I use the supplier now? Um, just in general, I think when we kind of try to quantify the benefits as well, I think it's also important to look at it from that internal stakeholder as well as external, you know, kind of supplier perspective. Um, how do they feel about this process? This is does tend to be an area where we see companies putting in a lot of SLAs with their internal stakeholders just because of the frustration and and you know kind of saying okay you know 80 90 percent of the time we're going to live up to that SLA. Um, so I think that's also an important aspect of it. But to answer the question directly, there does tend to be a correlation with the cost metrics that I showed and the cycle time metrics. Yep, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, we like to where possible kind of explore that sort of time to value. Like if, if a project is dependent on a new supplier or set of new suppliers being onboarded, can you articulate that? And, and I think people agree whether they can turn that into hard numbers for a business case, I think it's a little bit more challenging, um, but it's a cool topic. Okay, Doug, um, we're at time. So uh, we did have a couple more questions. So um, Chris, Eric, Sean, I know that for example, you've asked questions. Um, we, we've got those recorded. We'll come back to you with some written responses um so with that once more thank you ever so much kurt i thought that was fantastic really valuable information i can see people in the comments uh, endorsing that view so thank you very much for your time thanks everybody who joined um and as i say the recording will be published soon and uh, we'll see you again soon thanks very much kurt thanks anthony thanks everyone for participating bye-bye bye-bye